Thank you. I think Ron may not remember that I actually was a grant reviewer uh, for one of his grants, and he had to come and present his work at a site visit uh, where I was one of the grant reviewers. And uh, luckily, the grant was funded. So <laughs> that was many years ago, and it was actually a grant on plant biology, because Ron actually did also work on plant biology years ago. OK, so since I'm the keynote speaker, I, th I took my duty seriously. And I'm not only going to give you data, but I'm going to give you some of my thoughts about MECFS. So as you heard, uh, I'm the director of the Center for Innervating Neuroimmune Disease. And that's our name for this disease that's known as MECFS. It was the name was suggested by a patient. But, and it was actually suggested to the IOM committee, but unfortunately it wasn't selected as, as the name to use instead of SEID. So I'm going to be presenting the data first, and these are my lab members who actually gathered the data. Some of you have heard from Alexandra Mandarano, my PhD student who has now graduated and moved on to a postdoc in immunology. And I'm hoping she will return to the field when she uh, uh, finishes her postdoc, but I still have uh, a number of talented postdocs and students in the lab. I'd like to acknowledge that um, my support, I actually only have one full-time researcher in my lab supported by our NIH center. Uh, we also have support from Cornell, uh, from the Sloan Foundation. It's been very important to have support from some private donors. Uh, Cimarron Research has funded the collection of a number of the samples that we're using, and Solve MECFS in the past has funded the uh, analysis of uh, some metabolite, uh, uh, gathering of metabolite data. So right now it's known that a lot of different bodily functions are disrupted in MECFS. Many different systems are contributing to these five, what I do consider the five basic horrible symptoms of the disease. The lack of energy, the post-exertional malaise, the disrupted sleep, the brain fog, the orthostatic intolerance. Of course, there are many other uh, symptoms that most many of you have, many patients have, but I do think this is a core set of symptoms. and. Uh, of the various, symptom, uh, various systems that are important in, uh, in generating these, uh, these, uh, this collection of um, uh, symptoms. I think that I'm particularly interested in the nervous system and in the immune system. And uh, our center is studying both uh, the brain and uh, the immune system. My own role in the center is to study some aspects of the immune system. So many different health problems arise from immune dysregulation. If, uh, in the middle there, you see a healthy immune system that's in balance. But you can have parts of your immune system to be overactive and generate an autoimmune disease, generate allergies. You can have an underactive parts of your immune system, and that can result in cancer and an infection. And of course, we know that you can also develop an autoimmune disease after an infection. If your, immune, if your immune system wrongly attacks your own body. So we have systemic metabolism. That's the metabolism of all your cells and all your body. And uh, that uh, can affect, uh, be affected by your immune cell metabolism and vice versa. So if this is a Venn diagram, there's certainly an effect of your metabolism on the immune system and vice versa. And some of our earlier studies we investigated the, uh, the metabolism uh, use, using analysis of plasma metabolites. Uh, we know from our studies and from studies of other people, some of whom spoke at the recent uh, meeting in the last three days, we know that systemic metabolism is disrupted in this disease. And surprisingly, the, the plasma and serum metabolomic studies are largely consistent with regard to these three aspects. There are many studies now have shown disruptions in energy metabolism, the citric acid cycle, and fatty acid and lipid metabolism. And in the last three days, I learned about some additional uh, information uh, that is coming out of these metabolite studies and other groups. 
And we have published two studies on uh, metabolomics, and we have a third one that we're working on right now, in which we also are detecting some new disruptions that we'll be reporting on in the future. But I do want to point out that systemic metabolism is not the same as immune cell metabolism. We are studying immune cell metabolism, other people are as well, but it is distinct from uh, systemic metabolism where you see here the various organs in your body, your muscles, your brain, uh, all of those things contribute to systemic metabolism. But when you're studying immunometabolism, you're actually studying very specialized cells that have specific tasks to carry out to, get, to keep your immune system working properly. It's well known that different immune cells use different fuels to carry out their functions. And when uh, there's a disruption in the immune system, the different types of cells may have altered metabolism, but that doesn't mean that that is the same thing that's going on in your systemic metabolism. So it, this is just an example here. One type of T cell, which is something that we've been studying, uses glycolysis, fatty acid synthesis, and amino acid metabolism when it's carrying out its duties. But a regulatory T cell here is using the TCA cycle. So there's different uses of different fuels and different pathways for an immune cell to carry out its proper job. So when we assay metabolism of immune cells, it tells us about the functioning of the immune system, not necessarily about the functioning of the whole body. And most, most of the time, people analyze peripheral blood mononuclear cells. They're easy to, an, easy to isolate. And uh, what one problem about this is that they're a mixture of many cell types, and these many cell types are using different types of fuels. So we thought that in order to analyze more carefully what's happening in the immune system, we really need to separate these into different cell types. And we've started with T cells, that's been most of our analysis is with T cells, but we also do want to analyze B and NK cells, which are also very important parts of your immune system. So we can purify T cells, we can purify NK cells and B cells by several different methods. Now what I'm going to just mention today is that we have studied two types of T cells, uh, so-called CD4 T cells, whose job is to regulate the immune system. It, they secrete cytokines and they can induce or suppress the activity of other immune cells. And then we've also studied CD8 T cells, whose job is to cause the death of infected cells or cancer cells. So to study these, we used a, a study population from Incline Village, provided uh, patients provided by Dan Peterson's uh, practice, and uh, Cimarron Research kindly uh, supplied funding to uh, obtain these samples. And we've analyzed now 45 healthy controls, 54 MECFS patients uh, from this, uh, who have visited his office in Incline Village. So I've actually presented this work before, so I'm going to go over very briefly and just do the, the summary of what we have observed in, with regard to the dysfunction of the CD4 and CD8 T cells. So with regard to mitochondria, we see that there's normal mitochondrial mass in these cells. We don't see any significant differences in the mitochondrial function in the CD4 T cells. But in the CD8 T cells, we've seen a reduced mitochondrial membrane potential. With regard to glycolysis of CD4 T cells, we see that basal and compensatory glycolysis is reduced, and we see the same thing in CD8 T cells, that basal and compensatory glycolysis is reduced. So I've gone over this very quickly, and the reason is that this has been presented three times, a, a one, twice by myself and once by Alexandra Mandarano at the NIH meeting. And you can see these videos. There's links to them on our website, neuroimmune.cornell.edu, uh, if you want to get more details about uh, these studies. But obviously, it shows that there's something going on in the immune system. There's something wrong in the immune system. The immune system works by cell-to-cell -cell communication, either direct contact, as you can see in this uh, artist's uh, rendition here, or by secretion of cytokines. So a cell might detect, for example, a pathogen signal, and that will stimulate that cell to secrete cytokines to tell another cell, there's a pathogen present, uh, you need to get to work and deal with this. 
Immune cells, however, also communicate through release and uptake of extracellular vesicles. So these vesicles can be released by many different types of cells, not only immune cells, they are released by your brain cells, they're released by your heart cells, your muscle cells. Uh, so these, are, are, these vesicles are a way for cells to communicate with one another. Now the three types of uh, extracellular vesicles, there are exosomes, which are produced by exocytosis from the cell. These tend to be very small. Then there are microvesicles, which are produced by, uh, by uh, uh, pinching off of some of the uh, cell membrane. And then there are apoptotic bodies, and these are generated when a cell dies. So these are really bits and pieces of dying cells. So we wanted to study these extracellular vesicles in MECFS. And to do this, we had a pilot project uh, with 35 patients and 35 controls uh, using patients from Susan Levine's practice in Manhattan, New York. And you can see that uh, these patients are highly dysfunctional on the scores from the SF36. So the higher your score, the healthier you are. You can see our healthy controls are pretty healthy, but our uh, MECFS patients are severely limited by uh, fit their physical health and their energy. We found that there was no difference in the average size or concentration of, these, of the total extracellular vesicle population between MECFS and controls. These are called violin plots. That line in the middle shows you uh, the, uh, the uh, median of the, uh, different of the size and concentrations. You can see there's really no difference in, uh, in these uh, total size and concentrations. However, we did find a significant difference in the concentration of this small class of EV. Uh, it is definitely increased in our MECFS plasma that we've isolated these from. So we, we then, extracellular vesicles contain cytokines, they contain proteins, they can, contain RNAs, and the first thing we did was to look at the cytokines in the EVs uh, uh, and in, in the whole plasma using st uh, standard methods. We examined 38 of our subjects this way. And we found that the cytokine content of the EVs is quite different than the content of the plasma. So the compartment, uh, the EV compartment of cytokines uh, is not the same as in the plasma. Now this chart shows is a mathematical simplification of the group of uh, the uh, collection of cytokines in in each uh, uh, subject. So uh, the each of those dots represents mathematically the collection of different cytokines and their abundances. And you can really see that the EVs are different uh, than the plasma. But what about differences between uh, patients and controls? What we found was that there were no significant differences in the concentrations of individual cytokines between patients and healthy controls, either within EVs or in the plasma. And as some of you know, there have been a lot of studies of cytokines, many over the years, and they've always been puzzling and, and not reproducible and, and confusing. But just looking at the concentrations of individual cytokines doesn't give you all the information you will want to have to find out if there's something going on with cytokines in patients versus controls. So another type of analysis we did was to find out if whether the cells are communicating normally through cytokines. So when a particular cytokines level is high, is another cytokines level also high? And if a particular cytokines level is high, is another one's low? And in a normal person, there are these relationships between different cytokines because as you can see on the left there, the, these are diagrams of the communication of different types of cells. So one cell will secrete a cytokine, it'll go over and affect another cell which will then secrete other cytokines. So they're really a cascading response. So we looked at these cytokine-cytokine associations and found that there is a difference between controls and MECFS. Each gray line there shows a positive correlation between two cytokines, but the red lines show a negative correlation between cytokines. And you can see that IP10 in the plasma is driving a lot of the inverse relationship with other immune molecules. There's 15 negative correlations that don't exist in the controls. So this clearly shows that there's something wrong uh, in the uh, cytokine-cytokine communication between different cells in MECFS.
And if we look in the EVs, we see the same thing, except this time there's a different cytokine that's driving these negative correlations. IL-17E is driving negative correlations. With, uh, so we do now know that there is something going on here with, uh, with the cytokine communication process in MECFS. There's something happening in the immune system. So to, summary, to summarize, this pilot study shows that the cytokine content of EVs differs from plasma and that there's a dysregulation of the immune system as indicated by alter, altered cytokine correlations in the plasma and extracellular vesicles. And we're now currently carrying out a further study to identify more of what's happening and especially what's happening during post-exertional malaise. So we want to find out how plasma cytokines and this EV content, including RNA, and other proteins change after exercise and during post-exertional malaise. So we are collecting blood at these four different times before, before and after people exercise. And by day two, the patients will be ex exhibiting post-exertional malaise. And we want to find out if we can find a signal in the immune response that is either uh, causing or is a consequence of something that is causing post-exertional malaise. We also are trying to find out whether a particular immune cell is driving the symptoms of MECFS. Uh, this is a simplified uh, diagram of the different types of immune cells in your, in your circulation, but actually it's much more complex than this. If you, uh, there are very many different subsets of cells, especially T cells, that have a lot of different duties to carry out. And uh, these uh, different, any one of these different types of cell uh, could, be, could be disrupted. And when you analyze all T cells together, or even fractionated CD4 cells and CD8 cells, you could have uh, uh, miss, miss some differences that are occurring when you're looking at a whole population. There could be some uh, single cell type that has aberrant gene expression that is driving a lot of different uh, problems. So what we're doing now is not just looking at pop a whole population of CD4 or CD8 T cells or B or NK cells, but looking at individual cells one at a time. So you can, there's now technology to sequence RNAs in individual peripheral uh, blood mononuclear cells, and we can analyze these again before the first exercise, before the second exercise, during post-exertional malaise. This is being done by my colleague Andrew Grimson and Jen Grenier, uh, our RNA core director, and we already have some data, which is shown here. So each of these dots is the RNA gene expression from a single cell. And this are all the dots from actually 22 subjects, 12 patients and 10 controls. And we're now in the process of analyzing these individual cells gene expression to see if we can pinpoint some differences in particular types of cells between MECFS and controls. So now I'd like to switch into some of my thoughts about MECFS, some speculation about uh, MECFS, and that is what has caused the abnormal functioning of the immune system? I think that's a, a very important question we need to ans answer. And one thing we do know is that many patients report that they became, uh, they became ill with MECFS after an obvious infection. And perhaps 70% of our patients that we work with come to us and say, I, I can tell you the day I became ill, uh, I had a viral-like infection and I never got well. So I want to give a little history of the MECFS outbreaks, which David Bell uh, re refers to this disease as the disease of a thousand names because it has been named something different in many of these different outbreaks. These outbreaks have been occurring, recorded, and probably occurring earlier, but occurring since 1930s. And you can see here there was a huge upsurge of the outbreaks in the 50s, and then another upsurge of the outbreaks in the 1980s. And in fact, I would wager that a number of you here may have been ill, become ill in one of these outbreaks in the 1980s. Many of you perhaps watching online became ill in the 1980s. And in fact, when I was here at this meeting last year, and I don't know if she still is here this time, but I learned about an outbreak that's not on this list. This is probably not a complete, this certainly is not a complete list. An outbreak that occurred in China in the 1980s that's not recorded. There are probably many outbreaks in uh, different locations uh, that occurred. But you'll see that mostly we don't really have a lot of outbreaks. It's not major outbreaks occurring after the 1990s. And 
Now the question is, oh, one thing before I go on to that, I will say, first I want to say that these outbreaks, I've been reading a lot about these different outbreaks, and the different outbreaks are clearly identifiable as this disease, what we now call MECFS. And this is just an example of the criteria that Melvin Ramsey used for the outbreak from the 1955 Royal Free Hospital and subsequent outbreaks in the UK. It was more obvious then that it was initiated by a viral infection in the, these outbreaks, although the infection was not identified. And this description really uh, resonates with our current uh, five uh, major symptoms. He, he saw the uh, post-exertional malaise, number one. You could see the, the brain fog, number two, the sleep, unrefreshing sleep, the um, other problems, uh, and, and uh, chronic Ill illness, and then, and then uh, relapsing and remitting symptoms. So these outbreaks really are the, the same disease, but there's some variation between them. If you read the symptoms, uh, it does look to me like there's some variation in the inciting virus that uh, is caused these outbreaks. Nevertheless, it results in the, in the final common horrible set of symptoms. So, but why have outbreaks not been reported recently? Well, I think that the reason that they haven't been reported recently, that uh, the disease is now endemic. The sporadic, so-called sporadic cases are still arising where someone mysteriously gets it and it doesn't seem to be part of, of, an, of an outbreak. And there was an interesting article in Science in 2017, which this is, these are, this is direct quotes from that article. So uh, what happens when an emerging disease becomes endemic? And I think this really captures what's happening right now in MECFS. The disease itself takes on an identity, and interest groups form out of the populations where the disease is becoming endem endemic, often advocating for attention and action. But the disease must now compete for attention with other endemic diseases, even if the benefits of disease control still clearly outweigh the costs. So what's the usual response to an emerging disease? This article points this out. First, the disease appears or increases greatly in prevalence, as I believe it did in the 1980s. Then major resources uh, are uh, devoted to identification of cause, prevention, or cure that happened with Zika virus, HIV, and polio virus. Then, in the case of polio virus, it was nearly eradicated. But other, these, uh, both Zika and HIV are endemic, and there are certainly continued attempts now to eradicate Zika virus and HIV. But what happened in MECFS? We had an upsurge of, of the disease, but we never had the major resources devoted to identifying the cause, prevention, or cure. Now it's become endemic, and we now have slow attempts to cure the disease. So why is this? Well. Very foolish viruses announce their presence, okay? So Zika virus, HIV, and polio virus, they foolishly announced their presence, made it obvious that it exists, that there were horrible, visible marks on people who got Zika virus, HIV, and polio virus. And so what's the fate of these foolish viruses? Well, in the case of Zika virus, Congress gave 1.1 billion in Zika funding, and we already have a test of a Zika vaccine. In the case of HIV, we're now funding HIV at $35 billion in the US, and by 1990, there was already $740 million a year. And polio virus, we all know that it's largely eradicated in, 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 the, in uh, the developed world. But we unfortunately, genius virus incite MECFS. These genius viruses leave people looking like this, according to the stereotype. This is what people think MECFS is, just, oh, this woman tired over her coffee. This is not something serious, obviously. It's just some people being tired. And as a result of this stereotype by this very clever virus, this is what we have. We have $15 million in 2019. And if you look, this, is the, this graph shows the amount of money spent by NIH per victim of MECFS versus HIV and cancer. It's really very pathetic, as we all know. But this is not the reality. This stereotype is not the reality. The reality, as most of you know, is far worse. There are many people severely ill, unable to leave their houses, ruin their lives terribly affected. So what are these outbreaks teaching us? 
Well, there are two main theories of what's going on. These could be hit and run viruses. You're there calmly reading your newspaper, it comes along, hit, hits you, and you, ne and you now are in a terrible state. It's also possible that there's chronic infection. And there could be both. We could have hit and run, and we could have chronic infection. We could have some people with chronic infection, some people who've been hit and run. I would say that most people are thinking of this as a hit and run disease right now. But either of these could cause damage to your organ systems and tissues, and loss of control of chronic infections, disrupted your homeostasis, caused autoimmunity, affected your gut microbiome. So we need more research to identify what causes and maintains the constellation of symptoms in this disease. Now, how do, how do we get more research done? Well, we need money. And this is what you hear from NIH all the time, that NIH will fund more MECFS applications if more good ones are received. But in fiscal 2019, of applications received through standard routes, NIAID, which is allergy and immunology, is funding only 14% of its application. Our NINDS is funding only 16%. And what does that mean? That means that unless you have dollars specifically designated for MECFS so that more than 14% can be funded, you have to have seven proposals to get one funded. You have to have 14 to get two funded. So this is a very slow rate of funding when you only have 14% or 16%. So what about those of those 14 proposals? Are those 12 unfunded proposals bad proposals? Well, applications storing, scoring below the top 14%, in my opinion, are not bad proposals. This is what reviewers are asked, how reviewers are asked to score proposals at NIH. If you want to be in the top funding rate, you usually need to be exceptional or outstanding. If you're merely excellent, and this has happened to me, my proposal was merely excellent, wasn't funded because it wasn't in the top uh, 14 or 10 percent. Some, it, the funding is actually a little better now. It used to be only 8 percent at NIH uh, for some of the uh, institutes. I also think that many of the proposals that are rated merely very good or good are also perfectly uh, ones that are perfectly appropriate to fund, but if you only fund 14 percent, you're not going to get those funded. So what does MECFS research need? It needs set-aside funds, and NIH has a mechanism to do this by special program announcements or by request for application. And I want to contrast what's happening in MECFS to what happened in AIDS, because AIDS was a foolish virus, uh, HIV was a foolish virus, revealed itself, and so very quickly uh, Congress began earmarking AIDS funding so that you could fund more than 14 percent. You can't tell me if you were funded only 14 percent of AIDS proposals, we would have saved as many lives as we did by the development of drugs. So recently, uh, the working group for MECFS research presented its report at, uh, at the uh, NINDS Council. And uh, you can, you can uh, read this report at this, uh, uh, at this uh, URL. And uh, I have to say that it's a, certainly a step forward. There are many good uh, uh, suggestions in this report of things that should be done, including a strategic plan. Uh, there are many good suggestions in here. But what's not in here is a suggestion for set-aside funds, for a request for applications. But I want to say, what is this council? Well, the council is 20 distinguished researchers and clinicians who t whose task is as follows. They are supposed to review the final review of the, of the applications, but they also provide clearance for concepts for new research initiatives involving set-aside funds. I would like to challenge this working group to come up with a new initiative involving set-aside funds for MECFS next year when they report again. But if this... <laughs> But if this is what people think MECFS is, we're not likely to get set aside funds. So what do we need to do, we need to tell people that they need to worry about MECFS because we don't know how someone gets it. Lives are ruined, it's not a rare disease, and there's no FDA approved drug. We need to tell everyone this, not to just people on the council, but the public, medical professionals, everyone needs to know that they should be worried about MECFS. So I want to end on a positive note. I want to discuss how will more research result in treatment. And I will say this, that during the years of neglect of MECFS, 
There has been significant progress made in other areas. A lot of this funded by NIH, but also by other governments. And these are just some of the projects that have resulted in a lot more tools and things that we can now do. So the Human Genome Project, for example, we can now really analyze genes in ways we could never do before. We can find genetic factors that might cause a disease or make you susceptible to a disease in the case of ME-CFS, and that will help choose the right medicine and the correct dose of that medicine to help you get better. We can develop antiviral drugs and vaccines much more rapidly than we could back in the 1980s when HIV was first arising and, and causing AIDS. There's a brain initiative that's funded to the tune of $400 million this year, which can, will be mapping the brain, developing new tools for the brain. And given that the brain is involved in this disease, I think this should help us with MECFS. Something that I'm particularly excited about as someone who's interested in the immune system and MECFS is the large number of immune modulating drugs that have been developed to treat HIV, cancer, and autoimmune disease. This is just from a financial report which shows how big the immunomodulator market size is reaching. If you watch TV, there's lots of commercials come on telling you you should ask your doctor if you have psoriasis or rheumatoid arthritis about one of these immunomodulators, and maybe one of these can be repurposed for MECFS to correct your immune system so it's acting in a proper way. So what can you do? I say that you can volunteer for research studies, and you can. Uh, we're, we're currently enrolling people at these three different sites, and we may be enrolling them at a fourth one soon. Uh, we actually need controls. We need you to drag your neighbor or healthy relative to, to volunteer because patients are very eager to volunteer. We need controls, too, to compare the patients to. I say that you should lobby your congressional representatives. It's very important for people in Congress to know that this is a serious disease. I think we need to inform medical professionals, scientists, and the public about the disease, make them realize it's not a, a woman who's tired over a cup of coffee. It's a very serious disease ruining people's lives. And finally, I urge you to support your favorite research organization. Thank you. <laughs>